Leadership is not wielding authority, but empowering people. Becky Borden. And my guest for today has been doing exactly that, empowering me, the student. He has been the Principal Academic and Administrative Officer of the University of Health and Allied Sciences for about six years now. Right after this break, I'll be having a conversation with him. Go nowhere, I'll be right back. Welcome back to One on One. I'm Juliet Essenam, and my guest for today, before now, was the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Research, Innovation and Development in the University of Ghana, Ligon, and also worked under the Ghana Health Service as a Director for Research and Development. He's none other than the Vice Chancellor, the now current Vice Chancellor for UHAS, Professor John Chapon. Please, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, we'd like to know how you started your educational background to, as a young professor. Uh, my educational background, I'm not sure where you want to start from, but uh, <laughs> I started school in a very small village uh, uh, in the eastern region called Abenasu. Uh, in the Kwaibibrim district. Kwaibibrim, the dark forest. Uh, so very far away. Okay. Um, so I started primary school there. My father was in the army, so I joined him at Liberation Barracks Experimental School, which is in Sunyani. Then from there, I went to Burma Camp because my father was transferred okay. to Burma Camp Garrison Primary School. Actually, when you are entering Burma Camp, under the arch on your right side, you see my former school there. Uh, then from there, I did common entrance and then went to Aquinas in cantonments. Okay. Um, my father couldn't afford boarding school, so I went to a day school that was in cantonments. And after O level, I went to Presec to do my sixth form. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology to study medicine. And uh, from there, I worked in the Ghana Health Service, then Minister of Health for some time. I was transferred to Navrongo. I was in Navrongo for close to seven years. And during that period, I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to study public health in developing countries at a master's level. And then I came back, worked for a while, and then went back to study epidemiology okay. uh, the same school for another four years. So in terms of formal education, that's it. But uh, there are many other things that one picks along the road. Yeah. Wow. It's been a long journey. Yes. And uh, you mentioned that your dad was in the army. Yes. What, what motivated you to go into um, medicine? Exactly what motivated me. My father was... Uh, a medical assistant. Oh, okay. uh, so I guess I, get, I got exposed to uh, healthcare delivery at a very early stage. So he worked in what is called the MRS in the military setting, the medical reception stations, which is their, their health units. These days they are all developing into uh, hospitals. But uh, that was my earliest exposure. I'm not too sure whether that is what influenced me, but uh, in my days when you were in uh, secondary school and you did well in the sciences, everybody expected that you go to either medical school or engineering school, and uh, that is where I found myself. Okay, so um, now that you found yourself there, you, you really are enjoying it, right? Like Oh yes, I think I've really enjoyed everything I've done so far. But sometimes I look back and say, maybe I should have gone into computing. Wow. Uh, because I, I enjoy uh, computing. Oh, and uh, okay. I, I don't know whether uh, I would have done well in that area. But I, I enjoy computing as well. So probably uh, with some counseling, maybe I could have gotten into data science and things like that. 
And uh, in epidemiology, you do a lot of uh, understanding of health data. So probably I'm not too lost. Uh, uh, maybe a mix of the, the health sciences and the data sciences okay. in epidemiology. Because in epidemiology, we, we deal with a lot of numbers, trying to understand why populations uh, behave in certain ways or certain diseases affect certain types of populations uh, in some particular ways. And when you are doing an outbreak investigation, it's all an issue of uh, data and managing the data to try and make a complete story. Nice. Okay, so now coming to you being the vice chancellor, your vice chancellorship, you were in um, Legon yes. as the pro vice chancellor in yes. research innovation. Then you um, you were appointed, right? Yep. To be the vice chancellor of a young university coming up, and you had to leave Legon coming here. How was that? Did you were you okay with it? Like, how was the feeling? Uh, Having to leave. Well. Um, it's it's quite an interesting thing. Um, well, what many of you may not know is that uh, I I competed to become the vice chancellor of Legon University, wow. and uh, unfortunately, I I didn't get it. Yeah. So um, uh, after five years of being the pro vice chancellor, uh, they were looking for a vice chancellor here mm. for a university of health and allied sciences. And the vice chancellor must of necessity be a health professional. So I got a few emissaries coming to me to consider it. And uh, well, I considered it and putting an application eventually. And uh, that brought me here. Of course, when I came in here, uh, I asked myself a few questions. <laughs> Did I really make the right decision? <laughs> Transitioning from Legon with almost everything at your disposal to a place where there was almost nothing it was quite a challenge. Uh, and um, when I reflect and look back at what we have been able to achieve over the last six years, I think it's, it's quite refreshing uh, that we've been able to work together to achieve what is. Um, talking about challenges, actually coming to school as a young student, I was wondering, I was like, I already liked you has, but I was like, the school is scattered and like you don't really know like your way, you can't find your way, Every you have to be taking care every now and then, but when I, I heard you speak uh, about the plan for the school, I was like, Oh gosh, even if I don't get to experience it yeah. one day, I could look at this and say, this was where I went. And I've always loved your stories about the school. <laughs> so you mentioned challenges. Yeah. yeah um, I'm sure you have experienced and overcome so many challenges that has actually brought you to now. What would you say have been one of your most difficult and the most challenging thing you've experienced yet? I'm not sure which is the most challenging one. There, there are quite a number of them. One, one of the basic things for every university is some basic infrastructure. Okay. And uh, as you were alluding to, the infrastructure yeah. just did not exist. Uh, but there has been a team that had been around for four years who have worked their backs to get things done up to that stage. And therefore, the least I could do was just to also get focused and build upon the strong foundations that had been laid. Mm. This was not the time for complaining. Uh, it was the time to uh, build a coalition of the willing and uh, look for resources from every possible area to get going. And uh, that is what we've been uh, able to achieve so far. And also with a little bit of prudent management um, of our meager resources, we've been able to uh, put together a few things. As you can see, now we have a, a 640 bed assembly hall of residence, mm -hmm. um, which we built from our, our internally generated resources. Um, and it took us close to four years to do that. 
uh, it wasn't easy. Um, the, the easiest way to go about this would be to say, okay, all right, let's raise the, the user fees so students will pay much more and they will get more money to build. But of course, we live in an economy where uh, people are not very well paid. So you cannot continually raise the fees from that side. Uh, so then you need to think of long-term development. And uh, we managed to get um, the University Council to facilitate a loan to get us the second hall of residence, which is coming up actually to be ready next week. I don't know whether you've been there recently. No, no, please. Well, I've heard of You've heard of it, yes. That is another 680 bed uh, uh, hall of residence, which we have christened the Sokode Hall. So we have a Sogli Hall and we have the Sokode Hall. Uh, and uh, we believe that with the income that we get from the Asogli Hall, which was built from our IGF, together with the income from the Sokode Hall, we should be able to pay off this loan very quickly. Uh, and then also an issue of engaging government and uh, international community, particularly the Chinese government, to uh, facilitate a $60 million grant to build a school of nursing and midwifery which is the biggest in sub-Saharan Africa. Yay. What we have there now can seat, we have lecture rooms that can seat 2,500 students at a go. Wow. So 2,500 students can be seated at one time. We have four lecture halls that seat 200 people and another 18 or so lecture halls that seat 100 people. So. Uh, sometime next year, uh, all this issue about uh, people carrying chairs around will be a thing of the past. Oh, that's uh, nice. And the school is coming up very nicely. Yeah. And then also we have a skills laboratory with very excellent simulation facilities. It's, it's a top-notch facility that is coming up. And of course, we are developing the central administration also, which will free this place for the School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences to operate as such. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are doing a little bit uh, in all our corners. Uh, if you talk about Hohoi, our colleagues in Hohoi, we've invested almost all the Get Fund money that we got to develop the Hohoi campus at Fodome. It's about 70% complete, and it is my hope that within the next year or so, we will be able to uh, uh, finish that facility so that the School of Public Health can completely relocate into, into those premises. And with the opening up of the infrastructure and all that, other private uh, people are also coming on board to put up uh, halls of residence. Yeah. And for me, I think that is what uh, makes the school uh, grow. We've just started, and I believe the team that will come after us would also do their best to uh, move to the next level. Okay, talking about the team that will come after, um, now that um, you'll be leaving us soon, yeah. what, what, what do you think you're going to miss about being a VC of UHAS or just being a member of UHAS? <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm going to miss being a, <laughs> the VC of you has. Okay. <laughs> well, being the VC of you has is a lot of headache mm. that many people do not know about. Uh, of course, it appears glamorous, uh, but if you want to get the work done properly, mm. you, it, it's for me, it's not just a job. It was... Uh, it was a mission to be accomplished, you know. So uh, I wake up in the middle of night thinking of the next thing to do and all that. So, so I think uh, retiring as a vice chancellor is going to give me some sleep <laughs> <laughs> because I've missed quite a bit of sleep oh, yeah. on you has. Salaries are not ready. Uh, you don't know what to do. And uh, you keep picking the phone to call all the right people to make sure that salaries are paid and uh, it's 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 a lot of work it's a lot of work if you want to get it done properly yeah it is a lot of work so 
I'm not sure I'm going to miss that for now. <laughs> okay. So if you are not going to miss being the VC, mm -hmm. what would you say uh, was one of your memorable days or something you had to do because you were the VC? Something that was memorable to you? One of the things I really enjoyed uh, as the Vice Chancellor of this university mm -hmm. was uh, when I see young people like you go through there are programs of work and uh, come up stage for a handshake during oh. congregation. Uh, you can see a lot of excitement on the faces of everybody and their families and everybody is so, so happy. And uh, there is a particular group of people, the sandwich students. I keep saying that I will miss them forever. You know, the sandwich students, uh, usually don't have uh, a straight pathway like some of you from preparatory school you go to some of the best secondary schools and then from there you come straight to this place many of the sandwich students uh, have gone through a very tortuous pathway they would have passed exams all right, but because they did not have the resources to continue, they stop along the line, get a job done, or go to nursing school, uh, because there you can get an allowance, and then they finish nursing, and then they work for a while, then they come for a top up. And the f interesting thing is that when, they, when you admit one of them, you admit a whole family. Mm. You admit a nurse, Sometimes she's already pregnant when she's coming or she has a toddler. So she brings a toddler together with the household so that she can attend lectures. And you can hear sometimes the babies cry out during lectures. And uh, what fascinates me is that there might be three or four babies out there crying. But as soon as the baby cries, the mother knows it is, that is my baby. Yeah. And they go out there to go and pick the baby. And for me, it's, it's such a relief to see them come for graduation and uh, our policy of leaving no one behind for me uh, is something that I find very very gratifying so that is one of the things I'll miss wow wow that's so sweet <laughs> <laughs> okay um so um if you had unlimited power say you had unlimited power what do you what change would you have Love to, would you like to make here a new house that you haven't already done? Like a great change you want to see here in your house? <laughs> if I had unlimited power, yes. ooh, that, is, that is a very, <laughs> very <laughs> interesting uh, scenario. If I had unlimited power, I will not set up any university without the necessary infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If you want to set up a university, in the case of UHAS, with 11 academic units, eight schools, and three institutes, I will ensure that within a five to maximum 10 year period of time, all the structures are put in place. But I don't have that power. I don't have that pace. Yeah. I don't have that, those. because it is, it is for me very, very unfortunate to say I've set up a university, eight schools, three institutes, go and run with no infrastructure. As we speak now, the School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences has been built. So that is one. The School of Nursing and Midwifery is being built. And the School of Public Health is being built. All the rest are living in tents and uh, temporary structures. Pharmacy, yes, we have a, a small block there. That is not the School of Pharmacy. Actually, the, the, the strategy was to put up this building next to the School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences so that when the real School of Pharmacy is built, uh, this 
addition could be maybe lecture rooms for a graduate program or something like that. Because the School of Pharmacy should be another complex like we have here. Mm. The School of Medicine has not been built. It's what is on the, <laughs> what do you call it, the hospital campus is not the School of Medicine. So we are all struggling to make do, as we always do in Ghana. Um, and uh, I think it's unfortunate. And I, I have always said that it is rather unfair to the new universities to be established in name and mm. not in structures. Yeah. Wow. OK, so moving a bit away from VC, being a VC. Yeah. Um, what have you read or listened to that um, you took an inspiration from that you've kept with you for a long time now? Say maybe a quote or a song or a book and then you took some inspiration from it and you always remember it and has brought you this far. <laughs> uh, well, um, I don't remember the last time I read a storybook. So maybe it's an opportunity for me to get back to read a storybook. So I will not get into that. But, um, but as a Christian, I'm always encouraged by uh, the word of God. Every time I read the same portion of scripture, I get a different inspiration uh, that encourages me to be on the right track. Um, especially when uh, you have challenges along the line um, and uh, not everybody sees eye to eye with you and there could be some uh, detractors along the line. I, I get encouraged by the word of God. So, so the scriptures have been my, by my main source of inspiration. So, um, as, as to which portion of scripture, there are many portions of scripture yeah. that I can refer you to, but the scriptures have been my, my main source of inspiration. I believe that the, the good Lord uh, brought me here for a purpose. Um, and I think that uh, I have been able to do what uh, I could do with my strength and his guidance. Mm -hmm. Probably I could have done more, mm -hmm. uh, but that is for time to tell. But you, you have done a lot. Like, <laughs> when I look at your achievements, you have done so many things. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> How long have you been here? Just three years. I'm just three years, years. okay, all right. Not, not just in New Hearts, though, but mm -hmm. even though, just, even just in New Hearts, I've seen some of the things you do, I, and I like the way you speak so enthusiastically about you has. But when I go back to read your achievements from before to now, wow, there's just so many things. Your publications. <laughs> wow. You see, again, these are some of the things that I have fallen behind since I became the vice chancellor. Mm. Yeah, I, I think before I became the vice chancellor in 2016, I had about 120 or so yes. publications there I think about. it was over. over yeah, one. yeah. And over six years now, I've just gotten to 146. Mm -hmm. So I've slowed down yeah. on that. So, of course, when you are doing this kind of work, you can't find the time to sit down to write. Yeah, so I'm going to spend time uh, doing some more science and then begin to write my memoirs. After you retire? Oh yes, after, after this tenure. Uh, I'm going to take a sabbatical leave and uh, reflect on what the next steps should be. <laughs> wow. Okay, then this is from one of the students. He says that, what advice would you give to a young student or a young an individual coming up, wanting to do something great with their lives like you have done, what advice would you give to them? Well, I, let, 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 me, let me say from the onset that uh, when I look back mm -hmm. and people say, oh yeah, you've done a lot, you've achieved a lot, 
uh, I can see it because of the relativities when you compare to other people. Okay. But I must say that um, I did not set out. You know, these days you hear there are all these motivational speakers who tell you five things to do this, five ways to do that, ten ways to do this. Unfortunately, some of us did not benefit from any of those motivational uh, speeches or lectures. It was an issue of being committed and dedicated to our cause. I have been uh, the typical person who uh, from secondary school days uh, was in the scripture union and then when I went to university I was in the University Christian Fellowship so I've been guided by the principles of, of the, the word. word of God yeah which tells me that uh, when I set my mind to something I must do it well and excel so for me it's the desire to, to excel, excel. And uh, because I believe we all have the capabilities, God has granted each and every one of us with some skills uh, which uh, we need to harness. Uh, somebody may have to ginger you to get you on the right path, but we all have something within us that we can do in a very uh, excellent way. So I think we need to find it and uh, work at it and whatever your, your, you, you, you find yourself doing, do it such that nobody can ignore you. And that has been one of the messages I give to all my graduating students. Mm. That be so good that no one can ignore you. It means spending time to improve upon yourself spending time to know what your area of work entails reading and these days there is so much information on the information highway uh, but a lot of us spend almost all our time and data on <laughs> a lot of frivolous things yeah. you know so I think we must get focused and uh, we can achieve much, much, much more than some of us have, have been able to do. Okay. Yeah. So be so good so that no one can ignore you. Yeah. Be so good that so no good. one can ignore you. Because yeah. if you are good and uh, you are excelling, people will look for you. Yes. No matter where you go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll take that with me. And uh, okay, so you mentioned that you are always busy, always having something to do. Um, how do you, do you input or juggle all this with your leisure? I mean, what do you do? Your hobby is something you like doing. Uh, I enjoy football so much. I enjoy soccer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I enjoy soccer. I used to play when I was much younger, but uh, these days with my pot belly and all that, I cannot do all that kind of thing. But, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm a uh, an ardent fan of Kumasi Asante Kotoko. We just hey. won the league. And uh, the indefatigable Liverpool Football Club. So we never walk alone. Uh, I have all the memorabilia of Liverpool all over my house. Every time I go to Liverpool, I, I have something. So I guess I probably have about 10 different Liverpool shirts. Hey, uh, wow. uh, every, every, every season. And yeah. it's designed. I, I enjoy. I, I, I'm very sad that Sadio Mane is going to, to buy Munich. But he's, he's paid his dues. He can move on. That's yeah. not, I'm confused. <laughs> You're confused, you see? Yes. Shout out to the Liverpool fans. Yeah, okay. you never walk alone. Yeah. So finally, before you go, yes. please, um, what would you like to tell us, your student, that you haven't already mentioned? <sighs> I think I've mentioned everything. almost everything, uh, but um, let me rehash and say that having made the grades to get into you has, you are good enough to excel. 
you are like some diamond which when you get out of the ground doesn't look very great it needs to be polished and it is when it is polished that it attracts all the attention and the pricing that the, the precious minerals and marketing groupings would be interested in. So there's some gem inside you, you know, and uh, you need to polish it. And this is an opportunity for you to polish that gem. And uh, the time that you spend here, be it four years for most people, or six years for medical and pharmacy students, or three or two years for the top-up students, make very good use of the time here. Because time does not come back. You may miss certain opportunities if you are not very careful. And uh, you may live to regret it. So make the best of the time that you have here. It is very, very important. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time here. Thank, Thank you, you. So if you hadn't taken anything, if you didn't hear anything, make good use of your time here in UHAS. You are a gem. And you just need polishing. And be so good that no one can ignore you. Yeah, see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>